Hello, welcome back to Open Relationships. My name is Andrea Miller, and I am your host, joined by Joanna Schroeder, my co-host, and Brian Atkins, our amazing producer. Whew, we have a sincerely epic show for you today. We did real-time live coaching with the world's number one parenting expert from dealing with meltdowns and tantrums to why you don't need to worry so much or at all about too many video games or those AP classes that you feel like your kid needs to master or even, believe it or not, why your child doesn't need to worry about getting into a top college. No joke. This is what we covered. And oh my God, I was so relieved after having this conversation I'm super eager to introduce you to our guest, Dr. Shafali. Dr. Shafali is a clinical psychologist specializing in the integration of Western psychology and Eastern philosophy. She is a New York Times bestselling author many times over, renowned speaker, and has just launched a compelling new podcast called Parenting and You. Dr. Shafali is sincerely the go-to parenting expert of our times. While she's been super helpful to me and my family, don't take my word for it. Oprah says, I've interviewed hundreds of child experts and Shafali is the best one. And wait for it, superstars such as Pink, Eva Mendez, Eva Longoria, praise Dr. Shafali's work and cheer her new podcast. Welcome, Dr. Shafali. Thanks for being on Open Relationships. Oh my goodness, thank you so much. And yeah, this podcast is unique because it's a refreshing new way to spread insights and wisdom and education. Instead of it being just a didactic conversation between two so-called experts, what I've done in this podcast is I coach the parent directly in real time. So yeah. that's what makes it different. Well, totally. And so what we want to do a little differently today on open relationships, I want to set the stage for the pod. And then you're going to you've agreed so graciously to do some real time coaching for Joanna and myself. We are ready with our questions. And I just I do want to emphasize having listened to this amazing new podcast. It is not your typical podcast. There are no expert guests. It's only real parents with real relatable struggles. You do real, and I'm going to emphasize, raw interventions in real time with parents who are struggling with their children. And I like how, you know, um, you talk about their own inner child challenges. And I just, I want to set the stage just a bit more for like the one or two of you who aren't familiar with Dr. Shafali. I think most people are. But Dr. Shafali is a leading pioneer of conscious parenting, if not the leader in this important movement. So just just again, really setting the stage. So, um, uh, Joanna, should we just jump right in? Do you want to start with your yeah. questions? Well, I'm so excited we have Dr. Shafali on right now because um, I, I'll tell you right now, I have three kids, 19, 16, and then we have a little, a little sweet surprise at the end who's six, okay? And she's my only girl. And she and I, a few, maybe two weeks ago, were rear-ended while we were stopped at a red light. She and I were in the car, car was totaled. She was really scared. My neck was hurt. She, her head hurt. We had all the ambulances and the all the all the all of the first response, and they were great with her. And she, since then, has been very reactive. And like, it's not like she's talking about a car accident. I have a sense that it comes from sort of this jarring moment, but. Like for instance, I'll be like, okay, it's time to leave the park. And you know, I've been parenting a long time, so I feel like I'm pretty equipped to handle a, a mini tantrum or a meltdown. But she's going like from zero to 100, like to screaming bloody murder just for what I would consider minor things. And it's my instinct to just want to sort of tough it out and be like, you don't need to do this. You can handle this. But I know there's something deep there probably from this accident, some trauma or something. And I'm just wondering, like, what would you do in those moments? What should I adjust? What do I change? Like, if I soften up too much and change, you know, kind of the rules or the boundaries around how I expect her to respond, is that setting a bad precedent? I, you know, help. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Thank you for sharing. So let's begin 
with uh, my asking, how have you been since the accident? Well, I had so much going on even before the accident. I finished a book and got it to my publisher. I was sick again and again. My immune system was just a mess. It was a lot of stress. And the accident definitely, like I had a plan that I was going to hand my book in and feel like free as a bird. And then the next day, bam, we get hit. And this, I had this beautiful brand new car. I loved this Volvo. Totaled. It, fe- it felt like an interruption of my plans to finally <laughs> relax, which, you know, they say we make plans and God laughs. And yet I feel like I'm going with it okay. I'm going along with it okay. I'm starting to feel like I can breathe again. Now I'm almost noticing hers is her reactions are getting worse while mine might be getting better. And I have pain. So pain, of course, makes us m- less patient, of course. Yeah. So if you can just go really deep into, you know, just connect with how you're feeling. I didn't hear a lot of feeling. You said, I feel like my plans didn't work out, but that's not a real feeling. So yeah, give, me, give me some feeling words about how you really feel. And, <sighs> and, and you know, both times I've asked you, you, you let out a long sigh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I definitely feel like I'm holding my breath too much, which is why I'm like trying to, <sighs> yes. how am I feeling? Yes, and I'm trying to get you to a deeper, connected, more still place within you because I sense that you're very high performing and high achieving, but your body needs some exhales. So let's take yes. another, let's take oh another one and, and go deeper and tell me how you're feeling. I think I'm feeling a sense of like just on a purely emotional level, like it's not fair. Like it's unjust. Like, like, you know, intellectually I go in and I say, well, life isn't fair. But my emotional feeling is like, this was not fair. Like this was not what we deserved. This is not fair to this little girl. Not fair to me to have to be so disrupted and have to get into this fight mode to you know, get insurance and all that stuff. It feels really like, you know, like my instinct when I tap into it is like, be like a little kid who wants to stomp her feet and make a fist and be like, that's not fair. That's, that's probably at the core of it. And, and exhaustion, like I'm tired, right? Tired. Right, right. So even the feeling there, you know, you described it, but the feeling is the toddler stomping, right? So yes. you're, 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 what is the feeling when something unfair has happened to us? It's, it's anger or is it frustration? Anger. Yes. Anger yes. and frustration and also just sadness. Yeah. There's sadness there. Yes. Yes. So let's yeah. just take a moment to just feel that. I don't think Joanna allows herself to feel these big feelings. She's such a go-getter, accomplisher, you know, competent. She's like, let's get on with it. You know, in the beginning when you... Yes. Oh, you nailed it. So your you pattern is to, is to, to, to clamp it down. And you, you said something in the beginning, you know, this is not how we, we deal with things, right? You said, yeah, you, you wanted to tell your daughter and you, if you mm-hmm. gave in, then, then you're setting a precedent. So you're watching... Yeah. What you're really saying and showing here by the the slight challenge you had to go into your own feelings is that feelings are very scary for you. Yeah, that's probably true. You want to hear a funny thing is it's like they're scary for me, not because I'm afraid to feel them, but because they'll slow me down. Mm, yeah. Which is that. Yeah, like, you know, I've got things to of, do. Right, right. There's more things to do. There's no time to waste. Feelings are a waste of time. So where do you think you got those messages from? Well, it's interesting because I think it was right after the accident, I was talking to Andrea and someone else, and I was saying I was getting sick. So we had the car accident, and then I was getting like yet another cold or virus. And I was like, I feel so much shame around having to take time off work. And I feel shame when I get sick a lot, which is lately I've been getting sick a lot, a lot of viruses. And and um, 
I don't know if it was Andrea or Sabrina or someone else at our company was like, we want you to rest. We want you to feel good. We want you to take time off. And I, I know it's not you guys. It's from inside of me that there's this shame with like not being strong enough to resist illness, which is so goofy intellectually. You can't, wait, you wait, can't wait, willpower. Wait, 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 wait. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. So you have this inner critic every time you're vulnerable. And that's the same critic you started with with your daughter. You, you were like, come on, I can't, you, we, can't, we don't do this. Come on, this is going to set yeah. a terrible... It's, it's a very hasty critic of vulnerability and, and messy feelings. So you learned as a young girl that messy feelings were to be covered up through accomplishment. Can you tell me where you could have learned that from? Do you remember? Well, you know what's funny is as a little kid, I was like more of the scapegoat in the family. Like I didn't have any accomplishments and people didn't expect anything of me. And I think they kind of thought I was dramatic and over the top. And I don't know if I would say weak, but that was the message. And then as an adult, it's it's almost like I have to achieve more and more and more to prove like, oh, I'm not that kid. I'm not that little like, I don't know, like bimbo stereotype. Like I'm going to keep achieving and doing more and more and more. I'll never slow down. I'll never be overly dramatic. Yes. I'll, I'll just, be the I'll opposite fall, of that. Right. I'll just fall sick a lot and, and to shame a lot. That I'll do, but I won't allow myself to be vulnerable. Do you see, uh, you know, and this is just a quick little uh, demonstration of how I work with people, but do you see how quickly we have uncovered the reason why you're irritated with your daughter has nothing to do with your daughter. We, I mean, I'm going to get to that in a second, but first the parent needs to realize why they are reacting the way they are. And we just saw really quickly that you learned in early childhood to wear a mask of stoicism because somewhere you have, a, you didn't learn it in early childhood, but you were called dramatic. You were called hyperbolic, reactive, emotional, and a bimbo, quote unquote, that's what you said. So you're like, hell no, I'm going to enter my masculine energy and do, 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 do. And you've kind of divorced that gentle, feminine, girly, soft side of you. And now when your daughter is showing it, you want to suppress her and make her enter her masculine. And she's appropriate. She's she's ready to have feelings. She's been shaken up. She's traumatized. She's on edge now. The world is suddenly yeah. an unsafe place. You know, even adults who've been through accidents, you know, the world is shattered for them a little bit and it takes time. But you have so overcompensated for vulnerability through compartmentalization, which is a very masculine defense. You are now looking at her like she's crazy, but she's right. She's totally in her body. Transitions are now going to be very difficult. So the one place kids kids universally act out when they're under the age of 10 is in transitions. What is a transition? A transition is going from one safety zone to an unsafe zone, unknown zone. So anytime you take her out of a groove, she's going to express uh, resistance because fear does that, right? Fear makes us stay in the, in the known. And that's all she's saying is, mom, I need help in the transitions and I'm panicking because my sense of safety has been destroyed and I need your help. But mommy, because of mommy's history with big emotions, she's looking at it like, what's wrong with my daughter? Yeah. So if she's really in that heightened phase, I know what I need to do is bring my reactivity down, but I also don't want to minimize it. So if she's like screaming because she doesn't want to leave the park, it's it's like, what do you think is a good way to help her feel seen and be in that moment with her Yes, without yes. escalating it? Yep, I'll tell you. So when, you, when we observe an extreme reaction from children, either in, in any kind of transition, the answer and solution will not be found at that moment in the park. So what you need to do now is start role-playing the park situation or that transition situation at home. What does that mean? Understand that the child cannot learn when they're hyper emotional. So you cannot teach them anything at the park. Number two, cannot teach anything if mommy is hyper emotional. Number three, 
our children don't have skills in their brain, literally their brain is not regulated enough to have the skills to be resilient in that moment. They're not articulate, they haven't processed, they don't know how to verbalize their feelings, they don't know how to ask for help. So for all those reasons, we need to practice. Practice that transition now. So you can be her, she can be mommy, you can be her, you, she can be a bystander, she can be the friend. Different ways to practice and teach her, you know what, we can be safe and you can be seen, and these are the ways mommy's going to show you. And you're going to give her all that at home through the play situation. So play is children's work. Play is how children practice and develop that muscle. So the main thing, though, the biggest takeaway is that you guys went through a trauma. Big T or small T, it doesn't matter. The fact is the child now needs to be safe to, to express that emotional volcanic eruption and mommy doesn't like volcanic eruptions she's scared of she's never you you you've stayed away from that part in yourself so this is now an invitation to really go back and accept your own emotions this if you begin to accept your sadness and you begin to accept your toddler tantrum rage that you said you have and your sadness and you really feel it now you're going to empathize with her and you both can hold each other and go, I know, I like that car too. Let's make a little picture and say goodbye to the car or let's like talk about it, right? How much mm, have you really talked yeah. about the, How much have you talked about the accident? We've talked about it. We've actually talked about it quite a bit. Um, she definitely doesn't appear to want to talk about it, but I like the idea of like, let's draw a picture of it. Let's make a card for it. Let's... Let's remember it and let's process it. Let's process yeah. it. And maybe we can say goodbye to the car and give it kisses. You know, the car was taken away. I mean, and it's just a symbol of the transition, right? And, and when the transition is disrupted, we need to go back and visit. So it's the same when a child, uh, you know, gets bitten by a dog. If you don't process the trauma, the trauma stays suppressed. So the best way to immunize our children from the trauma is not to keep them away from trauma because no one can control that because you couldn't control the accident. The best way is to fully process it, which includes allowing space for her to have these, these outbursts. And I feel like, I feel like what you're saying about me kind of, Oh, it's so interesting when I, I if I can envision myself in that moment, like saying goodbye at kindergarten and she starts to get really, she gets kind of panicked, right? Like I can feel the energy doing that kind of thing. And I, my instinct is to like stand up and be strong. And you're saying, from what you're saying, I'm, I'm getting a vision of myself instead getting on her level and eye to eye and saying, you know, oh, I know you, I hear what you're saying that you don't want me to leave. And I and really, mom, I'm feeling that. Leave. And mom, yeah. And I wish I could say all day, I love you so much and give her lots of hugs and be really soft. Like yes. try and really lean into that softness. Yes. Match it. Okay. Match it. You know, when our children match say, it. mommy, don't go. I miss you. Our, our panic sets in and we're like, oh my God, she's going to cling to me for the rest of her life. She's never going to leave the house. She's going to live in my basement. And you you go into cat, cat, catastrophic mode. But if you match it, oh, I know I miss you too. But mommy doesn't want to go. Do you think I can hide in the closet? Do you think we can hide in the closet? Do you think you can just hide me in your school bag? And then you start laughing and she'd be like, don't be silly. You have to go. No, I don't want to go. Put me in your bag. Put me in your bag. Now, if you do it that way, she'd be like, mommy, you're embarrassing me. Go. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. But, but, but what's happening is you're feeding her on an emotional level. Yes. 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 You're like giving her this nutrition that she needs in a way. I like thinking of it that way. Like she needs that softness. She needs me to be right there in that moment with her rather than, you know, I have this idea that as a parent, I'm almost supposed to be like a lighthouse, you know, in the distance. And in reality, it's like you to be in that moment with her, that validation must feel so good for it her if I can so do that. Good. It's like your best friend, okay, who you're talking to about an accident or, a, you know, terminal illness or a catastrophe, you lost your job. Do you want the best friend to jump in the boat with you and just stay there with you? Or you want your best friend to say, let's go to the shore before you're ready. 
You're like, no, can you just sit in the boat with me and can we just both cry together? And that's what we resist because it's so hard for us to sit in feelings because as children, we were divorced from our feelings. Mm. Yeah, it's great. And then we, we know really the goal would be to break that cycle. Yes. And what a great invitation. It is trauma that takes us back to either a healthier way to deal with trauma or a more dysfunctional way. So you get to make that choice now. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Thank you. I really like having a vision of what I can do on a practical level in the moment too that feels, I can feel it like almost in my chest. Like that's, like that's, that feels like a relief. Yeah. Even imagining that interaction. Wonderful. I'm happy. Great. <laughs> I, I'm feeling and, better too. I was like getting <laughs> nervous over there. And by the way, uh, Dr. Shafali, uh, Joanna and I are both totally self-described, trip, self-described uh, type AAA Aries. So when she's like, I don't have time for my feelings. I'm like, I know I don't either. <laughs> so it's we're like very we're, driven. We're, <laughs> yes, we but, are, but, yeah. But but we are actually driven from anxiety. We're not driving toward empowerment. We're driving away from anxiety. Driven, too much drivenness, especially in us women, is our shield to fit into a masculine world. And we feel like, you know, because the world is mostly masculine and feelings are discounted and accomplishments do matter more than our heart. We feel in order to be successful, we have to do it that way. And we are divorcing ourselves from the present moment, from our children, from our heart, and we will fall very ill because we are not made up to do this sort of do, 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 you know? And we look down upon the being, 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 and thank goodness we have children uh, because they will hearken us back to that presence and uh, heart-based the heart driven approach to life. Um, and, and I think we're all running away from it in our masks of hyper masculinity and hyper accomplishment. And I think it's a wounded, it's a wounded drive that we're embarking on, you know? It really is. Yeah, totally. In fact, I, I love, uh, I love how you talk about our, uh, kids, their jobs are to be our our, our, we're, our job is to be their guides, but they're like some of our greatest teachers. I've often described my boys, Nick and Alex, as my little Buddhas. And it's just that that framing helps a lot. But, you know, the I guess the whole this is the whole point of conscious parenting, right? Yes, I mean, yes. It's and, like, and, and you saw in, in how I coached her, this is how I coach people live on the podcast. She comes in with something, you know, at this place, at level A. But before you know it, we are in one to three we had a completely different metric and we're we're talking about stuff that you it may not be apparent right at first and that's why i think coaching in real time is so valuable for people to observe because then they realize oh my goodness i do that too and this i, I can translate it to my own life and i realize i'm not alone and people learn better through stories than if i had to lecture her you know, if I had to give you all the same thing in lecture format, it would sound as boring as this. I'll just give you a few sentences. You know, uh, ch- uh, children need us to be emotionally attuned and need us to match their uh, their feeling state. And it's because we were wounded in childhood because of our traumas, we are unable to do so. But it wouldn't hit you in the same way as if I took you through. And, and we got to see her resistance to the feelings, right, Andrea? You could see totally. She had, a, she had a hard time getting to the feeling. She did. She was a little resistant. I saw that, Joanna. If I might say so myself. Well, I have to tell you something. Something you just said also just blew my mind, and it feels so right. And I feel like Andrea will relate. We'll see. So you were saying, and we end up when we're pushing, 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 we end up getting sick. And I just started thinking about so this this last six months, I've gotten virus and food poisoning, just sick, 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 sick. Every month. And, and you've been grinding it occurs, it like nobody's business. I've, yeah, I've like been grinding. Like, but I, and I've been blaming it on how hard I've been working. But I think it's something deeper because then Shafali said, um, as we push it away, we're going to get more sick. And I think at, every time I get sick, I push harder. Instead of hearing, it's actually the pushing that might be contributing to me getting sick. It's like, 
oh no, well now I've lost this week of productivity or I took this day off for a sick day and I'm behind, I have to push harder. I have to lock it down harder. That's just gonna make it get worse. Exactly. So, so, so then life keeps throwing us these curveballs saying, when are you going to wake up? When are you going to process this? And even this accident, you wanted to just plow through it and you wanted your six and you wanted your six year old to plow through it. But look how authentic she is. She's like, no, I'm having a hard time. I need help. Our kids are our Buddhas. Yeah. And I feel like here, if, here if to wake can... us up. Yeah, really. And that's why, I mean, I'm such a fan of your work. So thank you so much, Dr. Shafali. Okay. Uh, let's see. I have a question. I just want to be mindful of time. I've got like a million questions, but I'm just going <laughs> to pick one. Um, I have the greatest kids in the world, Alex and Nicholas. Alex is 11. Nicholas is 14. Um, and so I'm not talking about anybody in particular. Well, you know, just trying to keep uh, their anonymity here. But what do you do if you have a teen or tween who is super bright and athletically gifted, but who want to spend the vast majority of their time on their phone or playing video games? So as a parent, are you concerned that they are becoming too addicted to this? Yes. And I think, and I, I am, I'm, I'm saying this with some trepidation because I know you could be a little tough on your uh, podcast guest. <laughs> I thought, I thought I'm so gentle. <laughs> no, 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 you're really not. <laughs> no, but it, it, it's just the right amount of, of honesty. It's great. I mean, I've listened to your show. I love it. Um, and, and so I think in a recent episode, you talked with somebody else, another mom about achievement. And so when I think of, I've got these incredibly bright kids and I want them, I'm not, no lie. I mean, of course I'm achievement oriented too. I want them to achieve their full potential because I do believe that serves their greatest good. I think I can say in my heart of hearts, I don't, I'm not looking for a trophy child, but I, I do think for them to apply themselves they you get something back when you apply yourself and so when I think about and not that they don't I mean I, I certainly don't want to make it sound like I mean they get good grades and all those things but so so part of it is yes I am concerned about addictive tendencies with devices and then the other part is I in my heart of hearts I want them to get a sense of how good it feels to apply themselves because that that achievement in in the right dose will um will um help them feel better about themselves i think yeah and and i think on the surface your thesis is sound and tight but <laughs> but, uh, uh, what but you... underneath it is <laughs> totally flawed <laughs> no, no but but what what point is a good philosophy if it doesn't apply to the people, right? So let's bring it down to you. you have this idea, as all of us parents do, there's not a single parent who doesn't want our kids to be productive, purposeful, high achieving, successful. This is a given. And, and we believe it will give us joy. Okay. We believe the pathway to joy is a little bit of application, hard work, success. I, I would agree. But here's the thing. What is going on with your child right now? So number one, what is going on with your child? Number two, does your child need the parent, you, to create stronger boundaries around the electronics? Because it's like telling an alcoholic to be productive, but if the alcoholic is addicted and inebriated, they're not going to be productive. So do we need to look at your boundaries around, you know, your firmness around uh, video games? And, and I say this because you have boys and for any feminist who's upset that I'm not including the girls. I mean, it just research has shown that boys play more video games and girls do more social media texting and selfies. So if you're afraid that he's spending an inordinate time on video games and it's having a detrimental effect on him and he's still, quote unquote, a child, what boundaries are we creating so his brain is not getting so diverted and polluted? And that comes to you, right? And then number three is, what can we do to help him feel a sense of worth? Is he missing worth, you know, uh, in your relationship or in his home? Or is he missing connection with himself or you? Uh, what is he missing? But that is number three. So we first need to start with, you know, 
what's going on here? And, and do I need to create more boundaries? First, first, I need to take away the toxins, right? And then we can begin the healthier modality. So tell me, when I talk about boundaries and your screens, what happens to you inside you? Does it make you scared? Does it make you feel confident? What does it make you feel? Uh, you mean to take a, to remove devices from one or other well, of my to have strong To have stronger boundaries if you think he's on it too much. Um, I, I guess, I mean, I, if I'm, answer, if I'm understanding the question, it, it, it makes me feel, um, good to say, listen, I, I, I want you to have this in moderation and then to have, to have that space that you are doing other things that will develop your brain, you know, going, it's like, we all talk about like touching grass, like you're outside, you're doing these other things that are beneficial to you. And I mean, fortunately, what I can say is they, both of my kids have great friends, they get good grades, right? So there's a part of me that's like even listening to myself going like, well, then why am I complaining or, you know? So let's go I'll there. So let's go there. So if it makes you feel good to create a boundary, have you then done it or you think you are not doing it even though you say it makes you feel oh, good? Oh, no, there, then... is a, there is massive resistance um, uh -huh. with my kids because, and, and, you know, and it's like the logic is we've got good grades and like there's nothing else going on. And I'm like, well, okay, that is kind of true, right? So it's okay. like I almost want them to or, you know, one or the other. But see, but see, here's the thing. Here's the beautiful thing, Andrea. In your own narration we can see that there's some inconsistency and confusion is it a problem or is it not a problem right and you you're trying to figure out that like, i don't know where to stand on this but, some, <laughs> right? but something but something is feeling bad for you now i want to ask you is it really bad like if they've got friends and they go outside and they're doing well in school and they seem healthy enough is it okay or you're like, yeah, it's okay, but I want more or is it not even that and it's terrible because I'm not understanding what is the issue and that's why the parent needs to dig in deeper to go, okay, what am I, there's something that you're afraid of. So why don't we go to your fear? There's something Should that we you're not. <laughs> there's yeah, something no. that's, that's. If very... I did it, you have to do it. <laughs> Ooh, what are you afraid of? Oh my God. I mean, like, let's just go from like zero to 60. I mean, for sure. I, I'm, you know, as we talked about overachiever, need to do more, prove myself through accomplishment. So if I'm being honest, and my, my, my goal with you obviously is to be honest. It is, there is, a, you know, I'm going to admit that part of me that says, Ooh, you guys, are, they're really bright kids. Like they, they can achieve more. Right. And that will, serve them. And I, I, I guess I'm probably, I really, I believe it when I say I'm not looking for trophy kids. Maybe I am, maybe I'm not, if I'm being honest. Um, but when I think about what serves their greater good, that they have that self-discipline that they know, you know, Hey, I'm going to have moder you know, more moderation, you know, a little less video game time or iPad time. And then I'm going to take that initiative to to go and do something productive. But I, I guess, again, if I'm being honest, I put so much weight on being productive and doing that I am sure. And I can just listen to myself and it's like, oh, good Lord. It really is. Shafali, it really is about me, isn't it? <laughs> as much as I don't well, want it to uh, be. We're just, we're just, we're just here to, to be a reflector back to your own, you know, dilemma. It's not easy. Listen, it's not easy. And let me ask you in practicality, do they really get good grades? They really do. They're like eight, like all, like my one, one child, all A's, and then the other child, all A's and two B's and the B's in like an honors okay. class. Okay. Yeah, so they're so really then, good grades. then just like the parent I coached on the podcast, you have to look into your own childhood history around achievement and how much you have defined self-worth by achievement. So now you define your self-worth by their achievement. And even though they're achieving, but they're not super excelling, hyper insane at level like you and uh, Joanna, you're feeling like, oh my God, they're not worthy and I'm not worthy. But this is time to really question your own definitions of achievement. And I think as parents, 
we have such high standards based on our childhoods around anything. It could be somebody who's religious, somebody who's an artist, somebody who's an athlete, somebody, it doesn't matter, somebody who's charitable. We want them to be how we were at the same level. Um, and we have to really re-examine where we're coming from. You're certainly projecting something on them because they're saying, mom, we're okay. Where are they? Uh, would you say they're happy kids? Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're delightful. And they're well adjusted so far? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so... So what's the problem? Coming... <laughs> Me, so obviously. Is... No, but yeah, but it's coming from you. This is... But this show is the pressure you put on yourself. So imagine if you're doing this to them, what you live with, right? You're not okay being okay. See, we parents are not okay with our own ordinariness or our own averageness. We all, for those of us who were raised to be superstars, we are only okay when we are in the presence of our own or other superstardom. And, and that superstardom is an illusion because the minute you scale one mountain, the next one shows up. And that's how you have lived your life, Andrea. Like it's the next mountain, the next mountain, the next mountain. And your kids are thankfully not living like that. Uh, but to you, it feels like emptiness or incompleteness or lesser thanness. Mm -hmm. Not enoughness, right? Which was always my story. It's not enough, not enough. And that's why literally the awakened family was my Bible. And I just, I'm like, ooh, I need to read it again. I, I just, and for those who aren't familiar, the awakened family is one of Dr. Shafali's um, New York Times yeah. best-selling book. It's one of these. It's this one. It looks like this. It's oh, got it's some beautiful. Daffodils I mean, it, on it. <laughs> it is. It's a kick in the butt. I mean, in a really, really good, gentle, beautiful way. But like even what you're saying to me, it's like, you know, I mean, what I'm proud of is my husband and I have raised these amazing, really thoughtful, um, wonderful, kind kids with big hearts and all that stuff. And you're right that for me to to be more aware of what I'm projecting onto them and between my own not enoughness. But I will say this, not not necessarily in defense of myself really at all, but as I feel like it must be said, when we think about valedictorians not getting into the college of their choice, right? Valedictorians who have like all the all the like superstar um, uh, athletics. That, and okay, there, there's your fear. There's your fear. That's your fear. That's your fear. You're like, where the hell are they going to go to college? Well, and yeah, maybe. I mean, I think, yeah, maybe. Because you're saying if valedictorians can't get into a good college, what's going to happen to, what's going to happen yeah, to, to these kids? kids? Yeah, if they don't have like all the, um, like, what are they like, uh, community hours and all the, you know, just like we are as a society uh, molding these super high achievers as as young people and it just so I feel like there is that greater context of all right well if that's where the bar is then don't we as parents um doesn't it serve our kids to help them maybe if, you know I'm not asking my kid to be a valedictorian and a you know um concert pianist and, and that stuff but it does feel like there is a societal expectation to get into top schools to achieve more and, and yes, right, I can right. rail against that and say, I, I'm just not going to play that game. And yet I, I and my kids and my husband, we are part of, we are part of the system, right? So there, it, it, I feel like it's not just me. I, I have to, you just said to achieve more. And it stood out to me because it sounds like me. And when it comes we are down to it, uh, Aries, Joanna. Yeah. Well, and I'm thinking about our our kids, and my daughter's a little too little, but I have these big kids, and I'm relating to what you're saying. And in, in, when you just said that, to achieve more, I'm like, what is it we want these boys to do? I know. I don't want to. What push are we them trying to more, do? That is a system. We're in the matrix. Yeah. But, but, but we, listen, but listen, but here, yeah. we, we are in the matrix, but we are also part of the matrix. So we are doing it to each other. And you as an individual are empowered in this matrix to create your own rules to a very large degree. But if you bought into that, it needs to look a certain way and I need culture to approve me or he needs to be this wealthy or he needs to go to a top school. Uh, you are going to set yourself up for a lot of disappointment and burnout because 
the system is becoming so cookie cutter that it doesn't allow for flexibility and adaptation. So you need to realize that there is no such thing as a top school. There is no such thing as a top school. It's a list. Uh, it's like, is there such a thing as a top beauty? Right? You will say, no, as a feminist, all of us are beautiful. We're all amazing. Okay, apply it to achievement. The, the top school is the school your kid goes to. It's not the school you go to. It's the experience you glean from that school. I went to a rinky-dinky school in India. I mean, no offense to that school, but you never heard about it. <laughs> nobody, in, nobody in India has heard about it. It's not even on the map because it's not about the school. You can go to the most prestigious school and, and be completely disconnected. What is important in life is for, for people to own their lives. Does your child feel connected to their body and their life? If they do, whether they are a gardener or an investment banker, and what are you grooming all of them to do? What the three the three top careers of what doctor, scientist, and banker? I mean, what are what is what? Where are we chasing them to? Look at your career. You're none of those things. You're a wildly successful, creative person who made something out of nothing. So don't. You, you're coming to it with lack and prescription, right? And when we come to it with lack and prescription, we will lose. Your child will make the best out of it if they feel connected to themselves. If they feel connected to their joy, they will create a good life, whether a gardener, a garbage collector, I mean, uh, and I don't want to put it down, like a custodian. No, no, I get you, but like not what, what society sort of holds up as a gold standard. I mean, what what I love, I mean, how I would even phrase it, and, I, and it's a great wake up uh, call to me, so thank you. I feel like my job is to really help instill a sense of agency in my kids. And, and that's why I call them my little Buddhas, because it's like, I, I, I mean, so much has, um, I have benefited greatly from, you know, your, your work and this conversation and just really being challenged by like the conventional, like the societal conventions and like you say, there is no top school. And I wanted to say, but, but, and then you just totally like shut my butt down. So thank you. <laughs> right. Because that, but that's how, I mean, I feel like so many parents are, and that's why your podcast is so important because you are in real time having these discussions and talking to people like Joanna and me who are bringing our butts and our objection. I mean, both our, our booties as well as our <laughs> objections uh, to, um, Tua with just with your right with fear and concern and so much love and care for our kids and it it feels like it's just a gift that you're doing that so thank you uh thank you and listen it's not easy i i fall in the same traps every single day and and for that reason because i know how hard and harmful these traps are to my own sanity and well-being i wish to help parents to not fall into these traps but the trap could be as simple as Oh, the USDA said that we should all eat a big breakfast. So now I'm fighting with my four-year-old who doesn't like breakfast. And I'm going, no, the chart says the biggest meal of the day, the king of the day is the breakfast meal. And then it's a prince and then the pauper. So and the kid is like, do you mind? I don't like to eat breakfast. And so you see, when we follow prescriptions, we, we run into danger and we miss the present moment and uh, we just make ourselves miserable. So the you have beautiful boys. At best, I would say create more boundaries around the screen time, connect more, enjoy them, and trust that they will find their way. Well, I want to just ch chime on that. I'm saying it mostly for myself, but also for our listeners and viewers. Trust to me is the operative word. And when you say things like don't be prescriptive and you know rigid and so forth, when I think about we as parents, I mean, what's the opposite of fear? To me, it's trust. To, to trust ourselves and trust our kids. And when I get a little loco, you know, and I just said, like, my kids have a ton of friends. Their teachers have so much praise. They are, I mean, they're great kids. And then I'm like, why am I, you know, why do I feel that fear and doubt, right? It's my job to replace that fear and doubt with, with trust, trusting myself as a parent and trusting them as kids. But it helps to have these conversations. It helps to keep it real and to know, I'm not alone in this, right? So, and I kept exhaling while you were talking to Andrea because I, I have a lot of the out. same things. <laughs> no, it was like I was like, oh, 
Yeah, I needed to hear that. It's like, what do we think is going to happen when they're playing video games? Are they going to become serial killers? Yes, that's what we're thinking. That's what we're You're thinking. Somewhere inside, there's that little voice. So that's scared. Like, we're so scared. We're so scared. Because, you know, not actually, realistic. We're, we're, we're actually little children ourselves who haven't grown up. And we're like, why are we responsible for these people? We're so, we don't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> it's too much responsibility. What you know if, what yeah. it is? Here's the real kicker. We are not supposed to be doing it in nuclear families. We're supposed to be doing it with a tribe of 50 other women, older women who tell us, chill out, relax. And we, uh, number one, we're supposed to be doing it with older women who are your sisters and your mothers and all helping you. Number two, we're supposed to be doing it in a simpler world where you just, the child has only like two, two options, you know, play with sticks or play with the rubber, you know, that's it. You know, balls. Yeah, that's it. There are only two options like we had when we were growing up. Go to the basketball court down the street or sit in your garden. That's it. So this world has made us so psycho. That's why you're like the valedictorian community hours. Let's send them. Let's send them to Tibet. Let's make them a monk. Yeah. You know, yeah. everything to put on that resume. You are so stressed out about that resume, Andrea. You are so stressed out. That is your fear. And Americans have this fear. When I came from India, I'm like, what is wrong with Americans? Your the entire culture is set up for where are they going to go to college? Okay, exactly. but Anne, Dr. Shafali, my husband's from New Delhi, and he is way worse than me. Oh, well, then he's, <laughs> he's Indian. He's one oh, of he those. Is like way yeah, then worse. He's, then, then, yeah, but, but, yeah, I didn't grow up like that. I don't know how, but most Indians can be like him too because he grew up with probably a tiger mother. But, uh, yeah. I see when I, in India, we don't have this. Now it's changed. But how old is your husband? How old is he? 62. Oh, wow. And did he grow up with a lot of pressure on himself? Uh, I think so. I mean, he went to IIT yeah. Delhi. And... Oh, my God. Yes, yes, yes. yes. He I mean, you, like now the... you know my problem. <laughs> now I know. The, now it's like, oh, my. Oh. I know your children's problem. <laughs> and then it's Stanford and Harvard. I mean, oh no my joke. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Oh, my God. Multiple it. master's oh my God. degrees. And yeah, and he has sons. You know, I have another... Yes! Another, yes! My, my, my partner also went to Stanford and Harvard, and every day I tell my partner, do you know how lucky you are that you have daughters and not a son? I said, you would have crucified your sons. And is it, see, and he's like, yeah, I would have crucified my sons. So is, your, fathers, is, your, is your partner Indian also? No, he is, a, a, but he's a surgeon, and he's Afri African-American, so he got himself up and, like, survived and... Did, did amazing in this world and against all odds. But because he has daughters, he backs off them. But even with them, he's a little bit, you know, extra. But if he had a, a son, I keep saying, if you had sons, you would have killed them. So your husband with your sons must be extra pressure, you know? Yeah. I mean, and I'm, you know, as much as I, I try to, to be a buffer and, and he's amazing. I mean, to be fair, Sanjay's amazing. Um, but we're both really, I mean, we're a lot. Right. So so this is a really helpful conversation because they, you know, they have massive, massive overachievement in their genes. They live with us like, you know, from every way, shape or form. And so it's a really helpful conversation. To well, go. Andrea, remember when you were interviewing Alex for the podcast and you said something like um, something about what makes you proud of me? And I, I noticed then that he listed all your achievements. He's like, you got straight A's in school, which I don't you think worked is true. so hard. <laughs> well, but he listed all your accomplishments. And I remember thinking it's so interesting that that's what this little boy knows about you and thinks about you. And now we're talking about this. I'm like, oh, he's even internalized that about you. But, We've but, really created this culture. Yes. But look at Andrea's, you know, even her, the, her choosing of the story is because this is your core theme in your family. Both of you, you and Sanjay, have identified your worth around your achievement and it's going to show up now in your parenting in some way or the other, you know? Which, so it sounds like really what my job is, is to maybe, not maybe, but to over-index for, for them um, to trust themselves and have a sense of agency, to find that 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 pleasure and joy in life in in balance or you know that that's important too because for me to have pleasure and joy like last on the list like not even on the list 100 percent, and probably for your husband too because you'll have been trained out of pleasure and joy you'll have been trained out and you're both good children and you all carried the family trophy and you're like look at me i'm the family trophy you know i bet you sanjay's parents are still if they're alive still 
telling the people why my son oh, is, you know, 100%. IIT, IIT yeah, yeah. Stanford, Harvard is a uh, Indian parents' dream. So it's, but, but, yep, yep, it's going to be hard. <laughs> well, you know? and, and I love just to go back and again, you know, I, to the extent that where we go to college really doesn't matter that we we can and i'm going to say it mostly for myself but also for my my audience because i know a lot of people have the same anxiety that i have that it, it doesn't matter and i love your example shafali dr shafali where you're just like listen i i didn't go to a top tier school and look at me like you are a freaking superstar and that it, it's just it's like let's not be prescriptive like you say Let's not let these these things define us, right? It can be helpful if you go to Harvard, honestly, or not, right? I mean, or it can end up being a, a sense of entitlement that leads to a, a not so great outcome. I mean, there's some friends of Sanjay. So I'm of, like, it, it could be a sense of entitlement. It could be a huge deterrent of uh, feeling like a small fish in a big sea. The wherever it's it's also the wisdom philosophy of. Wherever you go, there you are, right? Like wherever you bloom, wherever you're meant to bloom, you will bloom. So this fear-based linear achievement orientation is a Western model. And the Western model is all over the world now. And mm -hmm. this is causing disease, sickness, disconnection, stress. You're not, you're not it's relaxed. You're stressed out. You're like, God, I have to get these kids to a top school. That's a lot of stress. What what weight we've put on the top school to be the answer? Yes, it could be a key, but let me tell you, uh, at the end of the day, I have many people who went to top schools who didn't do anything with it at the end of the day, or are miserable, right? I mean, let, or let, are let's miserable. Face it. Yes, yes. So it and is like not if, a, a prescription. If we can visualize what we want our four boys, my two and your two, what do we really want for them? And like, I'm pausing while you're saying this and I'm thinking about my boys. And I'm like, what is it that I really imagine for them? What would I really like? I would really like them to feel at peace inside, secure, so enough money to feel secure and like they achieved what mattered to them. Like when I get a peaceful feeling for them and I envision them, that's what I really want. And it, it's helping me right now to take some of the pressure off. Well, which AP classes are you going to take next year? Just to think, is that going to get this child to happiness, to a sense of peace, to a sense of security? And like now that I can re-envision that, it kind of reframes it for me, you know? Well, totally. And I want to go back to one of the episodes I was listening to on on uh, Parenting New, Dr. Shafali's podcast. There was a gal who was asking about um, her son was concerned about his performance in math. And so he wanted to take a lower math class. And I loved your response to that mom. I mean, and, you know, I feel like you talk a lot about um, connection and it just it feels like for us to have that connection with our kids so that they feel secure and don't feel like they have to perform for us, that feels like the secret sauce to me, right? And what you're saying to me, Joanna, even listening to you, because I mean, we're, you know, Nicholas is going to high school next year. So all like AP courses and all that stuff is right there for us. And when I think about him, I, I don't want, it's like, I don't want him to have pressure. It's like, I want there to be enough where he can, you know, he can uh, feel, uh, you know, like he can achieve things. And yet I want that to come from inside, you know, with that sense of agency versus that he has a societal expectation that he needs to make. You, you know? know, if we, if we step back a, a moment and realize that these AP classes are big business, you know, they are, they are, they are, they, it's a whole industry. It's a whole system. And how do I know this? Because my daughter was in 11th grade in COVID and suddenly there was no AP classes. There was no uh, SATs. There were no ACTs. In her grade, she was the grade that got exempted oh, first. Oh, wow. Uh -huh. um, and I was so thrilled. But suddenly the schools adjusted and they're like, oh, we need to see the deeper person and we need to see the whole person. And, and I'm like, oh, wow. But the AP businesses, all the tutors, all the centers, all the pressure, all that, dissipated and people lost a lot of business all the people mm, that were making money right out of this. right you know why are we pushing our children to take ap classes in high school 
the most definitive years of their identity formation is the most amazing time of their life is 16 to, you know, 14 to 18, 16 to 20, where they're supposed to discover who it is they are, explore the last few years of playing and the last few years of complete um, fear uh, exempt exploration, discovery, and experimentation because they're still safe, but they're in that really sexy age where they can do things on their own, but we keep them safe and we're going to bail them out of jail. But the, but instead, what have we done to this free, untamed spirit that is their right to proclaim is that we've put them into, the, okay, we're going to supersede, super fast, you know, take you to the future and put you into a college level classes now and sell it to you as if this is a good thing. So my daughter barely did AP because I'm like, I don't need you to do AP. I, you go where you need to go. I want you to enjoy every age that you're meant to enjoy. And academics and achievement is a part of your life, but I will not make it the whole of your life. But again, because you and your husband may have, and parents may have predicated their identity on their A grades, on their high, on their where they went to college, now they hold it as a badge of honor. So quite likely they want their child to do that, but it is a false sense of honor. It is not the truth. Um, and the truth is really, are you at the right place in your life for yourself? Are you connected with yourself? Is this giving you meaning and purpose? And that doesn't come from following prescriptions. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I mean, amen. I'm, I am uh, totally aligned and on board with this. It just, it's back to that, that feeling of trust and saying, we're going to play our own game. We're not going to, uh, you know, kind of abide by these uh, societal norms. I will say this. We lived in New York City for 19 years and we live in Colorado Springs now. I left New York. I was keen. I mean, I love the mountains and skiing and hiking, but I also didn't want to raise my kids in the pressure cooker, entitlement laden stew of the Upper West Side. And I love New York, right? But it just so, you know, listening to you talk about your daughter and the AP classes and the whole, you know, um, uh, private school industrial complex, right? And and to your point, like what, what I feel in my heart, the opposite of enjoyment, I think of kids jumping out of windows at Dalton. I mean, and not yes, just the yes. single out Dalton, but, you know, just these- Well, and all the Ivies. Yeah, the Ivies and a lot of these super top schools that breed these superstars, but their whole identity is back to like, did I get into Stanford or Harvard or, you know, name your so-called top school? And I'm like, get me off this. Like, I need the off ramp for this, yeah. of, of this for my kids, because this sucks. So well, something yes. is occurring to me right now that feels really deep. <laughs> we, first of all, Dr. Shafali waking us up. AP classes are designed to be college classes. Okay. So right then, why do I need to push my kid to that? And then I thought about what I told my oldest son, which was, you know, if you get those AP classes in there, you'll be safe for getting into college. And then I'm thinking about, okay, when they go to a good college, I'm thinking that's, they'll, that'll keep them safe. That'll keep them safe from underachieving, from failing out, from uh, under. And now that word safe is just flashing. Yeah, it's, it's a myth. It's, like, it's, it's not myth. safe yes. anyway. That's not what safety is. I'm like attaching this. Well, once you get all A's and B's, you're safe because you could get into a UC school. Oh, well, who said that? It's not even true. But that's the, that's what I think of when I'm guiding, even but now that's guiding fear, Bo, I, right? Isn't that yes. the fear response saying, if you overachieve and you do all this stuff, you're going to give yourself this edge, but then it's back to, okay, a surfeit of fear is an absence of trust. And like Dr. Shafali said, it, it's back to that scarcity mode. Well, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a myth anyway. It's a myth anyway. It's it's literally the idea of heaven and hell. Okay, I'll do all these things. I'll be a good person. When I die, I'm going to go to heaven. It's literally that mythological and uh, that unsubstantiated by any yeah, science. Irrational. It's, I mean, it's not, it's, it's actually not, it seems rational, but it's actually totally not it's rational. It's extremely irrational and we are destroying the present moment. We're wasting all of our time you know, I wanted, I'm not lying to you, my child to go to the, the, the school down the street, like save me money because anyway, I'm paying $70,000 for you to learn to do laundry and, and, you know, flush and flush the toilet and learn to pay a few bills. I mean, really, I mean, what are they really learning in, in college? Really, really, really. 
Uh, and most of them are just escaping their their families and, you know, engaging in a lot of risky behavior. And college is just a stomping ground. So if you're going to stomp, stomp here where I can pay $5 instead of $50,000, you know, if you're stomping away. But, but, but it is a parental industrial complex. I call that a parental. In, and we are suckers for it. And the reason why they've done AP, and look how genius, I'm not against a, a, the, the institution, no one needs to come to sue me, but let me tell you the genius. You have to get a certain level in AP course, courses, correct? So out of a, a pool, at least 40% are not going to get that, but they've paid for the preparation, they've paid for the entrance fees, and, and that they're going to have to do it in college anyway, so the college wins anyway. Number two, who said that the kid is going to do that major anyway, that they're going to use that course anyway, so the college wins anyway? So it's a, it's a, it's a very incestuous system between colleges and high schools and all these tutoring centers and the whole AP board. Like, who said that, so if I don't get that four or five, I've forgotten what it is, I'm not exempt anyway. So, oh, great. So I stressed myself out. I wasted all my money. I got a three. Oh, too bad. You're going to have to spend now more money, do the course anyway in college. You see how it's a it's a complete corruption and a rat race. And personally, I didn't want to be part of it. And I saw through it. And I said, this is utter garbage. Because anyway, the child doesn't know what they're going to do. Barely. Most children change their major, change their course after and only really decide after college. So why am I why am I stressing out? This is a long marathon. This is not a sprint. But we act as if time is running out because we parents are so anxious to sink into the present moment and allow life to work itself out. Well, it reminds me, what's the name of the, there was that whole scandal. I forget, it was like Inflategate, but that's the Tom Brady thing. But it was like those uh, parents. The Connett scandal. Famous... It was called the Connett scandal or something. Yeah. And, you know, famous lawyers some famous actors and so forth who ended up um, fabricating their kids' yes. backgrounds and so forth. And one of the guys, the dad said, I didn't spend all this money putting th this child through private school to have them go to Arizona State as if. Arizona State, and it may have been, I think it was that, but insert random college here. As if that would be the worst thing that would happen. That's a wonderful school. <laughs> but no, he and needed at, that status. At, right, but just look what he's saying. I didn't do all this work to put my kid into that school, so I'm just going to be absolutely corrupt, lie, let you plagiarize and, and beat the system because that's okay. Well, and totally dehumanized to me what they what these people did is totally dehumanized their children, the opposite of agency. They said, we don't trust you enough to get into college, honestly, or to not get in the right college. And if you don't get in the right college, that we don't trust that you can actually build a, a beautiful life. I mean, like your point of corruption, Dr. Shafali, to me, it's not just the it's like moral corruption. Yes. And in, in lying and cheating. But I feel like the corruption at, of corrupting another person's um, sense of agency, it's like it's so bad. And yet they were only doing what they could get away with because we know that kind of corruption and cheating getting into these top schools is has been rampant. Right. And yeah. so it just, you know, in like, India, in India, children are committing suicide, hanging from ceiling fans uh, because they're not toppers. They're called toppers. Uh, and, and you know what they do with the kids who are doing well? They post their picture in the newspaper. So what kind of pressure is this? The pedestalization, uh, uh, the pedestalization of achievement to the, to the point of the extinction of the human being. Yeah, well, totally. And that, you know, so I, I would say that that is occurring, particularly in the top. I mean, when I think of like rock science and, and these super elite, whether they're private or public schools, the super elite schools in America, it, it is something similar, right? Where it's just these kids are getting dehumanized because they don't meet that particular very, very limited standard of success. Right. And I will tell you, being a clinician in a 30-year practice, the children who follow these prescriptions, except for maybe 0.001%, I know two adults who were unscathed and you may be one of them Andrea but but most kids 
come to a screeching halt in their 20s and they burn out and fall apart. That's, yeah, because, totally. Because they've been robbed from their developmental stages. So eventually their body can't handle the stress of achievement and they need to slow down. And the only way they can slow down is through a mental breakdown. And we're seeing it rampant in our culture today. Our children are more and more at risk for suicidality, you know, prescription meds, uh, off, you know, taking street street uh, prescription drugs. Well, it's the uh, loneliness the epidemic. Street. It's a mental health crisis. I mean, you are absolutely right. Yes. The data is really, really clear that the, you know, that, that particular cohort is uh, disproportionately impacted by this crazy. I mean, yeah. and it is crazy. It's striking me what Dr. Jafali just said. When we are putting them into this cookie cutter factory of achievement, we are stripping them of being able to go through those developmental stages as they need to be. And I'm imagining, you know, the pressure. I think about how much happiness my teenager has when he can just walk to his friend's house and they just fart around for six hours. And when he's under all the pressure, he can't do that. When he's in baseball season and he's taking the hard classes, he doesn't get that freedom and he needs that freedom. Like I'm I'm having a like light bulb moment about stripping away their ability to go through those developmental stages and why they regress so hard in their 20s if we force them to do that. They really do. And, you know, I, I have to thank my daughter for it because she taught living and breathing with her because she wasn't driven to achieve. She was like, mom, I've just had a hard day at school. I want to rest. And she used to claim that rest space. And I was like, this is no time to rest. You rest when you're 70 years old. Okay, woman. <laughs> I, I want, But I would Way see go, myself Maya. because all the other children in the neighborhood were like going to violin and then going to learn a third language. And my child was claiming rest. And uh, she was like, I'm tired. I want to rest. And I... I, I was in such a battle to allow her to rest, right? What are we, what are we fighting for to, to not un ourselves, Joanna, to, to allow yourself to rest, right? We're not resting. Why has that become such a blasphemy? Because we have become sick. We are sick in the mind, chasing, you know, watch that documentary called Race to Nowhere. It is a race to nowhere. It, it is going nowhere, <laughs> So do you want to be bankrupt, exhausted, lonely, mentally ill, and at nowhere? Why don't you just, uh, you know, sing and dance and get there? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Like, why Why can't you just enjoy your, why? And I'm, I'm going to commit right now, Andrea, I think we can do this and we can keep each other accountable. Like, when we start to do that with our boys, it's like, what are we going for? What do we really want for them? I don't need them to go to a UC. I don't need them to go to Harvard. I don't need that. I don't need that for me. And it's not going to keep them safe anyway. That's not safety. Like, yeah, no, I'm down. That's we have to, I mean, but it's back to staying conscious. And, you know, even as you were saying, Dr. Shafali, about your daughter saying she needs rest. I mean, I could see, you know, my, my kids saying the same thing. And Joanna, you're talking about, I'm not sure if it was, uh, uh, which one of your boys, but like baseball and like just wanting to play and goof off for a handful of hours. I'm like, okay, well, that's what my kids are doing their, when they're playing four hours of video games. Like, yeah, yeah. And my kids too, they play their video games too. I mean, my middle son is such a high achiever with sports, but he loves six straight hours of Fortnite on a Sunday. And, and, and I can feel that tension inside of myself. Like he should go out in the backyard and throw some pitches at the strike counter. Why? Or Why? do or do something, anything but that is what my my lame, pr you know, productivity focused mind is like anything but that. And it's like, wh like you're right. right. That's like the the path to nowhere. Why? Why do Listen, I need to control that? that? If you guys said to me that your boys are isolated, your boys are, uh, you know, eating pizza in their room and not coming out. I would then say we have a big problem. But you're not telling me that your boys are adjusted, they are balanced, they are outgoing, they've been in nature, they've spent their physical exertion, and then they are, you know, in their downtime enjoying these video games. We we, we can't find fault with that. So it's, you know, it's a whole picture that we have to look at and not just take it, uh, you know, a little sliver here. and a little, It's a whole person we're talking about. So we have to keep things in perspective. And, and I know for sure that the most successful adults that I meet, and when I say successful, I mean who are truly connected to purpose and meaning, are those who were 
given an average level of pressure at home. So what that means is just a little bit like, hey, hey, come on. But they they were allowed to choose. They were allowed to self-govern. They were allowed to self-direct. And they were allowed to find their own kind of steady way of achieving and not let it be our way. Too much external pushing, leading, coercing, controlling will actually undermine your future goal of having resilient and extremely empowered, self-directed human beings. So actually parents work against themselves and don't realize it. Well, what I, how I was uh, uh, just in my notes when I was just thinking and preparing for this interview, I said, when it comes to raising great kids, you seem to be saying, forget about the kids for a moment. Let's raise great parents. And it feels like that that's it. Like so much of what we're talking about is and and not because we're foolish or bad, just because there is so much that has been handed to us unconsciously. And it's that it's that becoming conscious and having these kinds of conversations is how we really grow and evolve. And, you know, it just feels like that's the journey that we're called on as, as parents. It's totally circular. I heard you say that you're lame for wanting him off video games. And I want to be like, don't talk about my friend that way. You're not lame. You're being a good parent. You're doing it in the way that you knew best. And we're doing it out of love. That doesn't mean we have to keep doing it that way. But both of us, like, I don't want you to talk about yourself that way. So I'm also going to stop talking about myself that way. Like, I'm not being an a-hole not wanting to play video games. I'm doing the best I can, but I can also do a different thing. Yeah, and I think parents need a different voice to help them find self-compassion, like you just did, Joanne, for Andrea. That's why I look at this podcast I'm doing as building community where we can talk about these difficult things. They see me with a parent in the trenches, and we're, we're going to feel less isolated, less judged, and we can support each other. That seems what you just did with Andrea is what we need to do. But instead, out there, we are boasting about our children's achievements or we're talking in these very, you know, grandiose terms about our dreams for our kid and what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. And we are all raising the barometer of what that means for other parents. So we have to all take accountability. We can't say we feel pressure by culture. We are culture. So let us be the antithesis of what we feel is pressure. That's why I go out there, you know, when it was my daughter's, um, you know, 12, she was 12 years old and uh, she's partly Jewish and she wanted to have a bat mitzvah. So what I, what I decided to do to give her that at 12, but to do it my way, anti-culture way, you know, I sent emails to all the, the mothers and they were so grateful. They said, thank you for sending the invitation in an email because now you've given us all permission to not send those ludicrous big boxes of invitations that people spend money on. And I said, yeah, I'm the guinea pig. Everybody should send emails. Let's not make it a mini wedding. It's And I called like only her friends. I didn't make it an extravaganza because she's 12 years old. So Again, I felt the pressure from culture, but I decided to change the tune of culture for other parents and release them from the pressures that they feel because I know how I feel. So I don't want the pressure. I want to remove it from others. So we can help each other take off the pressure by, by being more simple, by being more ordinary, by being more okay with our averageness and allowing our children to fumble and fail and talking about that, not just boasting about the medals and the AP classes and where they go to school, focus on how difficult this this is, how, how much we struggle, how we don't know what we're doing. And the more human we are, the more humane we will be to our children. Yeah. Amen. And I let mean, them rest. Yeah, let them rest. But I love I just love that that we when we give ourselves permission to to if it, let ourselves off the hook, right? It's like, let's let ourselves off the hook a little bit. Do that honestly so that other parents can feel like, oh, cool. Like, I'm I'm not, I don't feel like I'm a slacker over here. Whew. Okay, Dr. Shafali, there is so much more to talk to you about. We got to get you back on open relationships. This was riveting. Thank you. I feel, I honestly, I feel so restored and energized. And I'm like, thank you. Like, really. Well, just, thank you, you know, so much. And yeah. I hope people will come and join me on the pod. It's called Parenting and You. It's already number one in many, many places, in many countries, and uh, on top of the parenting charts here in the U.S. as well. So uh, thank you for having me. I appreciate what you do in the world, and I'm honored to have been here.
Yeah, come back. All right, we'll talk with you again soon. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Shafali. Oh my gosh. Wow. Wow. Dr. Shafali, holy smokes. Blew my mind. But not yeah. not surprising at all. I no joke. I read The Awakened Parent at least three times. And I, I would go back, I would I typically highlight books like that that I read digitally. And then I go back and I read the notes again because I want to internalize it. I wanna it's like I, I don't want to just read it and be entertained and have that momentary aha. Like I want to, I want to live it yeah. and I want to internalize it. And so not surprised to have heard her feedback, but it's still so helpful and valuable. what do you think, Joanna? What was your best takeaway from that very, very intense and lightning conversation? Well, I mean, just specifically, as far as with my daughter, the idea of putting closure on the car being wrecked, mm -hmm. that was really important to me as just a specific tool of like, you know, once that car is officially totaled out by the insurance company, just being like, okay, here's the car and we're going to say goodbye to it and, and putting that closure on. But really getting the emotional experience of being able to envision getting down on her level and joining her in her emotion instead of needing to elevate myself and be like, the image I have is like a lighthouse. Uh, like, oh, I'm mm -hmm. going to be calm and guiding her. And instead, what she needs is engagement. I think that's going to be a huge game changer and then man like what a what a light bulb moment for me to recognize i think she was even talking to you and not even me that the more i push the sicker i get or the mm -hmm. more obstacles arise and then i keep pushing harder i keep creating a, a situation that's harder for me to come yeah. out of thinking i'm making it better no i'm making it worse i'm making it worse when i'm pushing harder against the obstacles it's like instead slow down slow down oh. you're not making it better busting your ass i always am like oh i bust my ass busting my ass is not a solving badge of the honor problem for so many of us yeah, right and it is based on yeah. you know coming from certain families and you know we're wired yep. at, like that as aries and so forth and so much of it is just even as she was saying taking that to you know i i in i was kind of internally shaking my head when she was like there's no top colleges and then i was about to interrupt i'm like no andrea just let her finish her thought and then i was like you know what i agree with you because this idea of yes okay let's say let's face it harvard mit stanford those are brands that are worth billions of dollars and have cash aid so there are top schools at the same time when i think about her greater point which is you can achieve great success if that's what you want however you define success. Success might not mm -hmm. be based on your career financially. I mean, I think that's her whole point is that it it, it really, your, your life's worth isn't predicated on where you go to school. And I feel like so, we have yeah. been so indoctrinated with that as especially, you know, like certain professional high achieving families and so forth. It's like, like you just feel like it's inescapable. And it's so refreshing to say, not I'm I'm just not going to subscribe to that. Like I'm just going to yep. think about it differently and do it differently. And if our kids want to go to one of those, um, you know, schools that are recognized as a top school and they can get in and they love it. But you were just even saying somebody that you're close to left a top school to go to a place that isn't as recognized socially. Yeah, a city college, but a city is, college is a better fit. I say that takes a lot of courage. I feel like kids that decide to take a gap year that takes courage, mm -hmm. right? Because so often. It's like, oh my God, everybody, you know, especially if you're a senior in high school, where are you going? Where are you going? Your whole identity yeah. is wrapped around not just where you're going, but but often for so many, you know, getting into the school of your choice, whatever your choice yep. is, and you feel less than if you don't. So when I think about some of these kids that say, I'm going to take a gap year, I'm not ready yet, you know, I'm going to do this or on two my... years at City College, those community totally. colleges and junior colleges. They are amazing bridges to success and they save their, you know, you get a ton you can of $120,000. Ultimately, also, it blew my mind when she said, there's no top beauty. And I keep yeah. thinking about husbands. There's no top husband. You didn't marry top husband. You married Sanjay, yeah. right? Like, he's not top husband. Yvonne's not top husband. We're not top beauty. Or top Where wife. did this yeah. idea that top matters? Yeah. Ultimately. Yeah, no, There's we are just not, best for you. We are in we are a nation of consumers and 
you know, we consume brands and labels. And so when I think of Harvard and Stanford and, you know, all these um, schools that have so much prestige, you know, that it's like, okay, we're, you know, we are as consumers and to the, especially to the extent that we're spending a ton of money, it, it, it yeah. all just, I feel like it is part of this, this just vast consumerhood, this vast feeling of, okay, this is what everybody else is doing. And we just, we got to play the game and, you know, we're all in the matrix. And I just, I love her. It's so refreshing talking to somebody like that, who is outspoken, out, outspoken, who has such an independent mind, mind who will say, I'm going to go against the grain. I'm going to, I'm going to call bullshit on this. And it's like, oh, yeah. good. If she can, then I can too. Right. And that's what we're yes. being called to do for, especially as parents to, to um, help our kids develop that sense of agency. Like, I feel like that is my number one job as a parent and not to subscribe to this. And you have to play violin and you have to be a concert pianist, pianist and you got to da, 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 da. It, you know, mm-hmm. and I realized that that's what she was coaching me in. And there's a, you know, I'll admit it, there's still a little bit of a disconnect between my understanding this and how I feel, but I'm working to reach But that's where it starts. That's That's where it starts starts is when we are able to go, I am observing myself doing a thing that's not getting me where I really want to go. Well, that's it. Yeah. Keeping me unconscious. And I feel like her, her whole mission is to help us see those blind spots so that we can be more effective, both as parents. And I would contend as a human being, because where I'm bringing that blind spot into my relationship with my kids, it is impacting me as a human being in ways that don't serve me. And so to yeah. me, just this idea of our kids as our Buddhas and our kids helping us wake up and become more conscious, if we allow them to, and, and it's and it's messy and it's hard and, oh my gosh, I've screwed it up so much and I feel you know, thankfully, I will say about myself that I've come so much further in forgiving myself and having less guilt and shame, which has been a great gift. I mean, it's just it's yeah. like, ooh, OK, why am I so hard on myself again? Does that serve anybody? And I just I say that for all of our listeners. It's like, oh, my God, that guilt and um, refusal to forgive ourselves. It doesn't help anybody. Like, I know yeah. I am not my best self when I feel like a martyr and I'm car- carrying around this um this feeling of God, i've just you know i've screwed it up because like i'm doing the best i can and i know yeah. that and you know one reason i can take advice from her so well i mean obviously i could take advice from anybody but i felt like i could really absorb it because not only is she a clinician she's a therapist she's a mom who has a grown child sometimes yeah. you get people who have like a six and an eight year old oh, right. and they're telling you how you should feel about your kid going to college and you kind of want to be like mm, okay talk to me when you're there but totally. she's been well, there. She, yeah, yeah, she has. And she keeps it real. And I look forward to having her back. And I'll, I'll conclude by saying this. Her book, um, um, A Radical uh, a radical Awakening, is beautiful. And it really, it, it spoke to me so deeply. So I'm eager to get her back on the show because she really, really keeps it real. In all her books that I've read, she keeps it real. And she talks about her own shortcomings and setbacks and these ways that it's like you can believe yeah she has all the credentials um and she's like and i've screwed it up and i've been in the mock and here's you know here's what i know from my own experience in addition to all her education and talking to thousands of people um clinically over time so okay uh that's a wrap thanks for tuning in to open relationships transforming together please follow us and subscribe. Um, We are so happy and grateful to bring you this show. Uh, If you have questions, advice, feedback, please email us at openrelationships at yourtango.com. We love your comments on Spotify, iHeart, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. We are super excited to hear from you. And I think that's it.